my name is Nicole Schultz. I'm a geospatial uh, uh, data librarian at the University of Michigan, and I'm so excited to um, host this event today. Um, we have four folks with us today um, from different sectors of um, of the world, of the workplace, and some of whom have also multiple experiences in, in, in different areas. So um, we'll be hearing from Todd Schubel, Feng Ningha, Jeff Jabakowski, and David Brandt. Um, and I'm not gonna introduce them because through their talking, they're gonna get a chance to tell you about themselves. Um, so I'm gonna just flash these questions up briefly here that they got ahead and each of them is gonna answer just a few of these. Um, and I'll, I'm also going to put those in the chat just to kind of help us get oriented as we're going through each of them. So we'll spend about 45 minutes hearing from our four panelists, and then we'll have 15 minutes at the end for questions. Um, do feel free to start putting those questions in the chat as you think of them. Um, and without further ado, let's get started. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And, um, and I'll put that first question into the chat. Um, everybody liked this question, so um, I'll, Todd, why don't you go ahead and get us started with this one? And I'll, I'm grabbing it for the chat, so give me just a second with that. Which one did you want to start with? Um, uh, it's the, how did you get to your current position? What was your major in college? Did you go to graduate school? What was your first job in the field? Okay, uh, so many, many years ago. Well, I'll start with... Uh, I'll start on my current position. So I'm the GIS manager for uh, Cook County, Illinois. Uh, so basically any maps, GIS data, you know, databases, you know, GIS software, anything like that, um, that you know, touches the different part, departments of the account of the county go through me. I've been here for just over three years. Uh, before that, I was a uh, senior lecturer, computer science, uh, computational scientist and GIS manager for the University of Chicago. And then before that, uh, I had various jobs working in um, uh, different uh, geospatial analysis or uh, land management. Um, I actually worked for ESRI for about six months. Uh, so I've, I've been around here and there. I did go to graduate school. I got a uh, master's degree in urban economic geography and GIS, and I almost started a PhD program at University of Illinois but the job at University of Chicago came up and I was really tired of being poor. So I'm like, oh, I'll take that job instead. And I'm like, oh, I can always get my PhD. And then I never got around to it. So, but uh, it turned out, it, it turned out for the best, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, the, the meandering way that I got here. Um, it's, uh, it, it's definitely a winding road when you sort of look back on your career as to like what connections you started with. But I think uh, to answer, uh, you know, what was my first job in the field was a GIS internship with the Village of Downers Grove, uh, which is a suburb just outside of uh, Chicago. And I got that. I think I was, oh, I was a, either a junior or a senior undergraduate uh, in college. And uh, I got that position. So, but that was my first paid uh, GIS position that, that was out there. So uh, internships do work, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So they, uh, they are worth it. And, and my major in college was urban economic geography and GIS as well. So it's like, I just kept it rolling for grad school as well. But that's it for me. Great, thank you. Feng Ning, do you wanna go next? Oh yeah, hi, hi everyone. Yeah, my name is Feng Ning. Yeah, currently I'm an applied scientist with Amazon. So my team is called Amazon Scout. So we are building a small robot for autonomous package delivery. So you can imagine for the near future, so you, uh, this robot will just bring all the packages to your house and drop it in front of your house. So that's what we are doing right now. So I'm working with the mapping team, I mean, with Amazon Scout. So our responsibility is to build maps for this robot, for localization and perception and all these things. So I have been working with Amazon for more than two years. I joined the team in two, two, uh, 2019. And before joining Amazon, I was a research engineer uh, with HERE Technologies at Chicago. So that is the previous mapping division of Nokia. So in HERE, uh, I'm working with the 3D localization team and, uh, and we're just getting LiDAR data and extract the features from LiDAR data and point clouds and generate a, a high definition maps for autonomous driving. Yeah, so that is my previous job. 
So I got my PhD degree from Purdue in 2017. And the, the research engineer job at here is my first job after graduation. Okay, and uh, I got my bachelor in China and uh, my major was GIS. And for Purdue, and uh, I, work, I worked a lot on UAV-based mapping and LiDAR mapping and the degrees from civil engineering. Yeah, so that's for me, yeah. Thank you. Um, David, how about you next? Yeah, I, I can also attest that internships work. <laughs> so I ended up, um, actually education, I was elementary ed of I ed is what I started with and got a chance to go to school in Scotland and, and got and discovered more um, social studies and geography and came back from that and to change it to geography. Uh, so geography, cartography for minor. Uh, did go to graduate school. St. Cloud State, which I got hired right out of grad school. I wasn't quite done. Uh, got my first job at Excel Energy. They were rolling out a huge new GIS project, and it's a multi-state thing, and I was back in like 91. So um, I never finished that first master's. So I ended up going back to school, which is what I advise you finish your master's when you have the chance. But um, I went back to school. I got a master's in sustainable community development. And I also teach as an adjunct at UW River Falls, uh, just across the border from where I live. And um, so internship at Dakota County uh, when I came out of, with my bachelor's degree. And uh, then I got a call about a new program for GIS at St. Cloud State. And uh, I was one of the first three in that. And it was kind of fun to put all my computer stuff and my geography and my cartography together and GIS was the right fit. So I've been at Washington County now for 26 years. Uh, I thought it was only gonna be a couple years after Excel, uh, but um, here I still am and I really enjoy what we're doing. So similar role to, role to Todd, I manage all the GIS stuff. Uh, coordinator, system tech, we pretty much everything. We're a pretty small shop. Thanks, David. Um, and Jeff, how about you? Yeah, hopefully you can hear me. I've been having some internet connection issues, but we got sounds you. like you can hear me good. Awesome. Yep. Uh, so yeah, I'll start with uh, my, my very first job in the field. It's kind of uh, widely different than uh, what most people experience. Uh, my first time uh, getting paid or, or what to, uh, to touch GIS was actually in the army. I was a, an enlisted soldier and I was uh, really, I was in the field artillery providing surveying and mapping support to uh, large cannons and radars that detect incoming cannons. And I worked with a device completely built for the military called the AFATADS, a big acronym. And uh, believe it or not, it was, it was a GIS. I didn't understand it at the time, uh, but it was to map out uh, safe flight corridors and uh, where you maybe would be firing rockets and things where you were not supposed to fire where airplanes, helicopters would fly. Uh, it was the Army Field Artillery Tactical Data System. Uh, very old school type of a computer, but that was my very first time getting into GIS. And I hadn't gone to college yet. I enlisted straight out of high school, but I knew between the surveying work that I'd done and some of that mapping work, I said, man, I, I really like this. And uh, so in college, uh, I majored in surveying and mapping. Uh, so I ended up getting uh, a degree in surveying, and then I followed up with a, a bachelor's degree also in, uh, in GIS. I went to the University of Akron, um, Northeast Ohio, go Zips. Uh, graduate school, I think it was kind of like David. I, I never quite finished. It was probably more short-lived than David. I, I would say do it and finish. Um, things can get in the way, uh, but I think there would have been a way for me to find a way. Uh, so, you know, and then at this point in my life, uh, probably won't go back. Uh, but, you know, I would encourage anybody, once you get started, you know, do whatever you can to finish. Uh, look for any ways to, you know, support that goal of yours. You know, don't let, you know, funding or, or something get in the way. You know, talk to anyone you can to look for other opportunities, you know. Um, and, just to kind of roll up that question, how did I get into my current position? It was kind of interesting. Um, I was at a conference and my predecessor was retiring soon. I had no idea 
who he was, we started talking. I was talking about my experience. He said, wow, I'm retiring soon. You should look for my job when they advertise it. Uh, and so that's kind of how I heard about this this job that I'm actually in now. It was much. It was probably a little bit while later, probably a year later, but that was where I first heard about it was from the the gentleman who worked in this role before me. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how I ended up here uh, at a, the National Geodetic Survey, part of uh, NOAA. Great, thanks, Jeff, for uh, taking that next question, getting started for us with that. Um, Feng Ning, do you wanna go ahead and tell us how you chose your current career and company? Oh yeah, yeah because I think this is a good match because this is for my PhD study. I'm, I, I did a lot of work on mapping, yeah, like UAV based mapping and ladder mapping. And for our team, we have, uh, we have our own mapping systems, like vehicle based mapping systems and UAV based mapping systems. So, and my research is also related to these areas. So, and I just want to continue my, my passion, I mean, in this mapping, mapping area. So that's why I, I started my job in, in, in here, at, with here mapping, yeah. And then later I found Amazon has these openings and they, they want to build maps for, for, for robots, for robot package delivery. So I think that is a good match. And in the meantime, they have all the resources I need to work on. They have very good sensors and very good systems. So I think that's a, that's a very good thing. So that's why I just choose this path to continue my career. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Todd, how about you next? The question is, how did you choose your yeah. current company? Um, they were hiring. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I, I, I had been looking for uh, the, the last few years while at the University of Chicago, I'd been getting the, getting the itch to, uh, to get out of the research realm and get into something different. Um, and a lot, I mean, what was really the driver at that point was job security more than anything. Um, whether you know it or not, if you're at a large private institution, you're usually only as good as your last project. And uh, when you bring in, you know, a million dollar grant or a $5 million grant and they start asking you, it's like, well, why wasn't it $10 million? And it's like, I don't know, sorry, I only brought you 5 million, not 10, you know? So the, you get tired of dealing with that, you know, year after year, time after time. Um, but I was looking for something that would be in the same realm as to what I was doing. But I had uh, interviewed at a couple different places. Some were uh, corporate environments like uh, Allstate and Walgreens, uh, and then some were some were more public sector. Uh, so looking at um, uh, Metro, which is the commuter rail system, they were looking for a GIS manager, things like that. But uh, Cook County uh, came up with their GIS manager position, and so. I jumped on it. I had known people who worked at, at Cook County and things like that and always heard good things. And plus there's super job security there. So it's like, I can come here and, uh, you know, uh, punch my clock for the next, I don't know, uh, 30 years or so, and then uh, get my pension and I'll be out of here, so. Thanks. Um, and David, how about you? Sure. So, so uh, I talked about getting started at Excel Energy. That was a pretty, pretty big deal. Um, coming right out of grad school and huge project. I was flying to Redlands and out to Colorado a couple of times a month, uh, working long hours. I was living in Stillwater, which is about half an hour from Minneapolis, located working in Minneapolis. So the commute got to be time consuming. And so the number of hours commuting and travel, I was looking at starting a family, got married and there happened to be a job a mile from my house right in town here. So um, doing exactly what I liked to, well, I wasn't sure at the time, but uh, took a big pay cut, started the first GIS coordinator the county had ever. They created this new position. I actually learned about it from one of my coworkers at Excel Energy, who was also applying for it, <laughs> but uh, I got the job. And uh, so I'm, I'm really happy about uh, just all the opportunity that it supported me as, as well, because having less commute time has allowed me to do things like teach and coach outside of work. So that, that work-life balance is really good for me. Great, thank you so much. So many interesting themes come up about the different, different quality of life things, just serendipity, you know, there's, there's so many different aspects. Um, 
The next question is about what kinds of jobs are available at your company for recent grads with undergraduate or graduate degrees and how important is a graduate degree for working at your company? Um, so uh, David, since you're still up there, why don't you go ahead and start out with this one? Yeah, uh, so I like, well, being a teacher, I like to have interns and we've done about 12 years worth of GIS interns and we'll typically, they work on grant projects um, and a lot of it is data collection, um, some analysis, but the degree, not degree, not such a big deal at that point. But when we are hiring, we do consider that, although we do have its or years of experience. So um, it, it's not, not critical, but it is a separator when you're looking at candidates. So I don't know if that helps answer. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, Todd, how about you? Um, it, it's sort of similar uh, to, to what was just said too. It's like, it, it depends on the situation. So uh, there's a lot of people at Cook County that have graduate degrees and there's a lot of people that have undergraduate degrees. It depends on sort of what you know track you're on. It's like, if you're on a management track, um, you'll find more more graduate degrees than, than, than less. Um, it depends on the type of graduate degree. I will say that you do find very few PhDs. Uh, they, there are, there are here and there. It's like, but a lot of them will, uh, uh, have a master's degree and which is all that's really necessary. It's like a PhD is a little bit of an overkill, uh, when you're coming to work in, in local government. Um, usually that's applied more in a federal government setting more than anything, but, uh, you know, as to what type of jobs are available, at least for GIS right now, it's like, we don't have any, there may be some coming up soon, but it's like, whether it's a GIS technician or, uh, you know, a, a GIS data manager or or you know whether we don't have necessarily like any urban planners or anything like that. We have people that do economic development, uh, people do engineering, so like our highway department and things like that. Uh, it depends on where you can apply your skills. You know, if you, uh, you know, what what sort of flavor geographer are you? It's like, are you more of an earth scientist? Are you more of a GIS person? Are you more, uh, you know, of a data wonk? You know, it's like it it really depends on sort of where you know where you might fit in, in any of those given situations but sometimes that's just dictated by the job description itself but um, as to whether a graduate degree is necessary it's not necessary it's nice to have but it's not uh, necessary to to get into local government thanks and Feng Ning, how about your perspective oh uh, yeah so actually uh, my current team is Harry right now. We are looking for a few software engineers now. I mean, yeah, so I mean, the main responsibility would be maintain our mapping pipeline and just building some infrastructures for our mapping database. So that is for the software engineer mm -hmm. positions. And in the meantime, we're also looking for a scientist, applied scientist, we call it applied scientist. So, uh, so for the scientist position, we would like to find someone with background of like photogrammetry and LIDAR data processing, point cloud processing, or even machine learning. I mean, deep learning, this kind of skills. Mm -hmm. So for the next uh, summer, I think we plan to find some intense. Yeah, yeah, but that is not decided yet. But currently, I think we are looking for software engineers and uh, scientists. Yeah, for our mapping team. Yeah. So yeah, I think, yeah, but for scientists, I think most of the scientists at Amazon has PhD degrees and, and uh, a small part has master degrees, but for software engineers, I think, yeah, bachelor degree would be fine. Yeah, yeah. If I could ask a follow-up, the software engineers, do you feel like it's important for them to have some spatial background or geospatial, or is that something you, that they can uh, kind of add on? Yes, I mean, uh, knowing something like spatial database, this kind or GIS, this kind of things can be definitely a bonus. I mean, for for this position, but I think currently, it's, I think the when we interview someone, we we still care more about the coding skills mm -hmm. and the, yeah, this kind of thing. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and let's keep you up there for the next question, um, which is for you and Todd. What are two to three key traits and or skills you look for in employees? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, for my current work, I think the team cares about two parts. The first part, because what what building, um, uh, we are running production pipelines on our side, and this is for 
for the robots. So we do care about the coding skills for the for the employees. So we want the employees to have strong coding skills. So that that's something we care about on our side. And in the meantime, that is another thing we care about is called domain knowledge. So that's that's something we want the I mean the candidate or the employees can bring to the team. So for example, for our team we have a few scientists, but all of them are with different background, have different backgrounds. So someone have PhD from mathematics and someone has PhD from physics. So this kind of things. So so for in terms of the domain knowledge, it means you can bring some some values to the team. Like for example, if someone is really good at optimization algorithms, so that means that is really re important thing for the team. Okay, and if you know something like you know a lot of geospatial related topics, I mean things that also very important to our team because we need to build up the mapping database and uh, do uh, spatial analysis. I mean for this team, so I think. I think we care these two parts. I mean, for the employee, yeah. So one is the coding skill, and the other one is we call it domain knowledge. Yeah. So the domain knowledge can be different. So maybe machine learning, maybe GIS, maybe three D reconstruction, or maybe computer vision, or maybe, oh yeah, computer graphics. All these kind of things can be important. Yeah. Yeah. So. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good reminder too that we're not expecting any one person to know everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes yeah. a group effort to work on a complex yeah, yeah, project. Yeah, yeah, right? group effort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, Todd, how about you? What would you have to say about two to three key traits or skills? Um, I look for versatility more than anything, and so you know, I want to see how adaptable you are to different situations. So, say, say for instance, like you know, to go in that programming vein say there's someone you know who's building web applications or you know or, or or software applications and they're they're a master at you know javascript or you know python or something like that that's great what if i ask you to make you know me you know a, a xerox copy at the copy machine and you just freeze up and it's like oh i can't handle this and it's like what do you mean you can't handle it it's like i want to be able i want someone who can handle you know different diversity of issues that necessarily come up it's like you know i'm, I'm looking for critical thinking skills is, is really you know so what i'm getting at it's like do you have the ability to adapt in different situations if you're not giving you know if, if you're used to doing analysis or development in a perfect environment it's like which usually are in school it's like you're you know you're sort of in a closed box it's like that's great you have to be able to work with whatever pile of junk you're given and say, okay, now make it work. And so you you have to have that uh, you know adaptability and critical thinking skills. Um, you know, now you may say it's like, well, how do I outline that on a resume? You you really have to show you know if you've had had positions or or taken classes or worked on projects or something like that. It's like I want to see you know something different. You know, something beyond you know, just, you know, if you're just doing geography and GIS all day long, that's great. It's like, did you have a background in history, in economics, in urban planning, in, you know, literature and whatever? It's like, I want to see what else, you know, sort of gets your juices flowing, you know, and gets your sort of mind turning to see it's like, well, is this the sort of person that, you know, is going to be a good fit for our team and that, that I can hand them anything at all, no matter what it is, whether it's related to their job or not, and they should be able to figure it out. So that's that's definitely something that I'm, that I'm hunting for when I'm uh, looking at candidates. Great, thanks. Um, Jeff, you're the one who picked this next one, which was, can you remember a resume or cover letter that really impressed you? What made it so memorable? Yeah, that's that's a, an easy one for me because it was the the mere fact that a cover letter came along with the resume that was, wow, that impressed me uh, and what made it memorable. <laughs> You know, uh, and I, I would encourage anyone to whatever type of job, unless maybe it's some sort of government position where they don't want a cover letter, but I know uh, us within the NOAA and most federal positions will accept a cover letter right there on the application. But I really would encourage uh, anyone, you know, in school and looking for a position, just finishing school, whatever level of degree it is, to include some sort of cover letter that describes some of those non-work related maybe passions or interests that you have that some tie to work or that show your diversity that, that Tom mentioned you know it's great to see 
a nice succinct resume, you know, that kind of rolls everything together. Uh, for me on the resume side, I like almost the shorter, the better, and then give me that cover letter that gives me some more info on you, you know? Uh, so that's what made uh, the recent cover letter that I saw memorable was that there was no other applications for that particular position that provided a cover letter. So we really didn't get a feel for some of those applicants, you know, until doing the interviews, but uh, reading this <clears throat> particular cover letter, uh, the person, you know, it wasn't, um, you know, just a, a rewording of the resume either. That was the thing. It was explaining why I'm interested in this position at this agency. You know, here's a little bit of info about some other things that I've done, you know, that maybe weren't really great uh, resume stuff, but it gave us that uh, good feeling that we know that person had uh, something that we do look for as Taz said, is diversity. You know, uh, it is great to see that you are an expert at one thing, but you do need to be able to, to touch on other things and complete, you know, non-expertise tasks uh, without, you know, daily supervision. Uh, so yeah, that, that was really memorable for me. And I would really suggest that that cover letter, you know, something short and sweet, just to give those uh, reviewers or those hiring managers something to look at when you're applying for positions. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and we'll keep you up for this last question. So everybody be thinking about your questions for our panelists. Um, if you could give yourself one piece of advice when you were a college student, what would it be? Yeah, so, uh, I know right now it's hard to go to conferences, you know, we're doing things virtually, most of us, but it would be to get out there to any professional conferences you can and go have fun at it, but don't have too much fun, if you know what I mean, you know, present yourself as that student or young professional who wants to, you know, make a name for yourself in your career, you know, you don't have to be world famous to make a name for yourself, you know, you can just be a you know, a local, somebody who's connected with your, your peers in the work. So yeah, go to these events, talk to people and uh, don't take yourself too seriously, but you know, I would really encourage you to, to have some fun, but not too much fun at the same time. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and David, you also thought you wanted to answer this question. Well yeah, sure. I I echo that too. I mean, definitely great great advice. And take advantage of, of mentorships when they're out there. And, and don't be afraid to, to call people that are already out there in the field. Um, you know, one of one thing that I took when I was going in college, well, when I was in college, was that helped me discover geography and GIS was exploring other things I was interested in. So I started in one degree path, discovered geography and cartography, and found, fell in love with it. So that was a good mesh of my computer and um, geography background. And, and you, you'll never have um, an, a better time in life than now to explore what you're what are the things interest you, what things really drive you, make, you know, derive that uh, dopamine release for you. Um, and so, yeah, I've had a number of students over the years that they get to my class and I'm, I'm teaching like the last two classes before they graduate. And they go, oh, I wish I would have discovered GIS before this. But they can still, you know, they can still use it in their jobs. But... Great. Well, thank you, everybody, for um, thinking ahead about those questions and, and having such useful, succinct responses to them, too. Um, for the folks who are here, um, or you can also ask each other questions, panelists, if you have them. Um, uh, do feel free to either uh, unmute yourself or put a question in the chat. And I think we're trying out the multiple spotlight feature here. Thank you, Shirley, for your support during this session. <laughs> hey, I'm going to toss out real quick, Nicole, if that's all right, uh, to a pitch. We're actually right now hiring for two positions at our Silver Spring, Maryland office within the National Geodetic Survey. And it kind of reminded me, uh, one of our speakers at the Lightning Talks was at the, the group at the University of Maryland. So I thought, hey, I'll throw this out there. Maybe they're still on board. But yeah, uh, these are positions that are more tied to uh, geodetic analysis. Uh, but uh, so 
processing or looking at satellite orbit data and uh, analyzing it before disseminating it on our servers. Uh, but at the same time, NGS, the National Geodetic Survey, as part of our small little agency of NOAA, we're really truly trying to embrace more of uh, commercial off the source type GIS work. A lot of our like our current databases are literally built from scratch in the late 70s. They're not even really geospatial databases, which is crazy to think, uh, but that's just how they are. And so now with our modernization efforts, we're really trying to branch out. None of this building from scratch. And so that's part of what these two positions would be on teams looking at, at those sort of efforts. Oh, I was gonna copy, I'll copy the link into the chat right there. I had it copied already. I've pasted it in there. If anybody wants to take a look, I uh, just wanted to put that out there. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, we've got a question in the chat. Do you see a lot of um, older candidates looking for career changes? I'm a returning student new to GIS, and this is all new to me. I can answer that. Um, sometimes, not all the time. So it, it depends. It depends on where they were coming from. So, you know, if they were, you know, just coming in, uh, you know, discovering GIS, it's like, say they were in real estate for like, you know, 20 years. And it's like, you know what? It's like, I really started looking at, you know, how the, the real estate maps or tax maps or something like that influenced, you know, the real estate market. And I just wanted to get into it and then see how it is. It's like, but we, you know, we, we, we accept all kinds. So if you want to give me, here's a little breakdown of how hiring happens at the county and how I got hired. And I didn't even know this until it actually had happened. So if there's a position posted, if there are more than 10 candidates, so, well, here, let's put it this way. A position gets posted, say there's 50 applicants, all right? Out of those 50 applicants, 30 of them meet the qualifications, all right? So that means our HR department goes through and makes sure you have number of years of service and all those other sort of things. So there's 30 that are qualified for one position. They then randomly select 10 to interview. They don't interview all 30, they don't give you all the resumes, they just randomly select 10. And then those are the ones that are passed on to the hiring manager and then they go through the hiring process and that. So I found this out after the fact and they're like, you know, I'm, I said, wait a minute. I said, so I wasn't put up against the best of the best to see if I and I came out on top and they're like, no, like, well, you were the best of the 10 that were randomly selected. I'm just like, Okay, and they're like, "Well, don't you feel lucky?" I'm like, "No, I can't find. I feel kind of cheated." I'm like, you know, so it's like, but but that's how the county does it. And it's like, so if there's a job that that there's you know you know dozens or even hundreds of applicants for it, they just randomly select ten, and that's it. So if you're because I had colleagues that I know who applied for my position who are qualified for my position, and they're like, "Dad, did I even get a call back?" And then I told them how the process worked, and they're like damn, you're lucky. And I'm just like, yeah, I guess so. So it's like, but um, just to say, like, if you are out there and saying, it's like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm new to the industry or something like that. So they're not going to pick me. It's like, no, it's like, we don't, we don't discriminate in any way. So it's like, but if you only have one year experience, then, you know, you may be the same as someone, you know, a 22 year old who just came out of college with one year experience. It's like age doesn't really matter. Um, but, it, but experience does. It's like, but, but you have a huge chunk of experience, um, you know, from whatever industry you're coming from that you could definitely relate in. So if you were a manager or if you're, you know, did, you know, managed projects or did, you know, I don't know, created, you know, stuff in your garage. It's like, it doesn't really matter. It's a matter of how can it apply to what you're doing right now. So it's like, so don't, don't think uh, you're going to get counted out because of that. It actually, if anything, it would be encouraging just because of it. So. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Just, um, well, the, our hiring is similar, but we get to see the candidates. So HR will do their filter. So you have to meet your minimum qualifications. So they take care of all that, but then we can actually get the pool of candidates then. So, so when, then we can start, start taking a look at the experience. And I, I kind of prefer the experience-based resumes to something that just says chronologically what I did. I just, I wanna get a feel for what, what it is people can do and some applied knowledge. And like Todd was saying earlier, like show more, show, show more depth or more breadth of, of your, what you can do, uh, what you can bring to the job. Uh, well, I've had I've had a lot of students that in my classes that were coming back in 
from other careers and and they found jobs in, in GIS. So so yes, I know I know several people that have done that. Yeah, I'd like to comment on that that question from Jennifer there. Uh, so my my first job position in the field after getting my degrees, you know, besides the military experience, uh, was doing GIS technician work at the uh, Muskingum Watershed Conservancy District of Eastern Ohio. And it was interestingly enough, you know, one of my coworkers, another technician, was similar to what Jennifer described, uh, new to GIS, but not new to the workforce, right? And so, you know, she taught me things more like, uh, we took a lot of calls from people that were, you know, confused about property assessment. So she taught me things about, you know, uh, customer service or be time management on the phone with people. And I was able to teach her some little tips and tricks and things that I learned, you know, as a, a GIS obsessed student, I would, you know, have fun by spending time in the lab, you know, it's free software. Why not go right. And so it's uh, you can bring something to the table. And somebody said, you know, everybody's welcome or, you know, we don't look outside or, you know, yeah, that's the same way that I've always perceived things within the GIS field and the geospatial field, even, you know, more outside GIS, but into uh, the surveying geodetics is that I've seen uh, there is a large number of uh, folks coming in from other careers, maybe not 30 years, but, you know, 15 years of doing something else, 10 years of doing something else and saying, wow, I discovered this and whatever that was, it's doing all right, but this really interests me and whatever that was might not work out in this longer term. So they're entering uh, the, that, the field, whether it's GIS, surveying geodetics. Um, the other thing I'll real quick mention, because it was a related topic and talking about somebody's odd um, hiring processes was uh, I've heard a lot. So I've worked in like three or four different federal agencies. Uh, and so I've heard a lot of rumors about how things work with federal hiring. Yeah, a lot of those rumors you hear just that they're not true. Um, but so if you have questions about that sort of thing, you know, look me up online on LinkedIn or on our website and reach out. Um, I'm always able to, to talk about those. Um, I could even talk about current positions that are looking to hire because I'm not on that hiring team but if i were you know hiring somebody i couldn't talk about it otherwise but yeah i'm always open to discuss those federal opportunities with people whether they're with noaa or with other federal agencies cooper go ahead yeah sure thing i have a question for jeff actually um i got to do some work with epa over the summer and i this perhaps isn't quite as like the process of getting hired and all sorts of things related, but just generally, can you speak to kind of the sharing of data between federal agencies and uh, like how you believe like match like NGS layers might be used by the EPA or things like that? So I'm just intrigued. You've worked for three or four federal agencies, so I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, so we could do a lot better on that front. Uh, there's been probably two previous efforts to put together, uh, you know, websites. And one of them was like metadata.gov and uh, something else, right? I can't remember, geo, I can't remember. But there's been a couple efforts in the past uh, to encourage or never really require, right? But to encourage the kind of things that you mentioned, Cooper, so uh, that, you know, agencies are sharing data. Um, and there's a new effort that's actually making this a requirement, uh, right? Uh, and it's the, the Geospatial Data Act of 2018 or the GDA 2018. So there's a few different requirements that are a part of that. And there's, believe it or not, there's actually penalties to those agencies for not following those requirements. Uh, what are the penalties? They haven't really been written yet. Uh, and there's a number of years before those penalties would actually take place. I think it was five years from that 2018 signing of that act. Uh, but, you know, one thing to remember when we look at data sources is government data sources is what the overarching agency is that put together that data. And so when we look at agencies, so uh, you mentioned like EPA, that's a data set, you know, that should be 
I think, out there for anybody to get without even asking those sorts of data. But then you get into other agencies like uh, Department of Defense, you know, right? They decide, you know, well, that's, uh, I don't know if you need that, right? I don't even agree with that because there's a lot of data that DOD uses that there's no reason to close hold it. Uh, but you can always request it. And the worst that the agency could say is, no, we won't give it to you. But even the DOD through a Freedom of Information Act, a FOIA request, will provide a lot of data. Uh, Department of Energy is another one where they're like, uh, I don't know about that, right? They kind of get uh, squirrely about releasing some data. But if there's data that you're looking for, and it's a federal data set, or had some federal funding behind it, it's your right as a taxpayer to get that data. So unless it's got some kind of security behind it. Uh, so I would encourage you to pursue it. If you're not having any luck, I I'll just say, reach out to me again via LinkedIn or my email online, because I've got a lot of connections I maintain and I might not know right away who to talk to, uh, but sometimes it's just a matter of, I've seen this a lot in the federal is that you're asking the wrong person, right? That FOIA request doesn't get to the person who's sitting there at a desk and wants to give you that data. I had that happen to me. I wanted, you know, I built these data sets of uh, hydrographic data of rivers. I was happy to give it out to anyone who asked, but if somebody else along the line in an administrative position sees it, doesn't understand it, they might toss it into some other bucket or send it to the wrong department and then it, the request never actually gets to the person who has that data and does want to share it with you. So I would say uh, look forward to that GDA, the Geospatial Data Act of 2018, as things start to become more requirements. And if there's data that you think is out there, keep trying. Use me as a final resource. I'll do what I can to help you get connected with the right people. Thanks, Jeff. Um, let's see. Uh, we have a question uh, for students starting to learn GIS today who will graduate two or three years from now. Does your crystal ball suggest any new or evolving GIS skills that might become important to have had experience with in their schooling? Yes. <laughs> there, uh, I'll, I'll jump on this one. Um, Definitely, uh, if you get into the realm of, well, the, you know, the, the antiquated term now is big data, um, but anything that has to do with either machine learning or modeling of extremely large data sets is really going to be where the future's at. We're, we're doing that now at the local government level where um, I'm, I've, I've taken it upon myself. We're collecting hyperspectral data, uh, oblique images, ortho images. Um, we're getting bathymetry uh, on every uh, water body in Cook County. Uh, that's going to be happening over the next year or two. So we're going to have mountains and mountains of data, you know, more than we really know what to do with. And so the only way to process this data is to automate it. But knowing how to build a model, train a model, you know, those are the skills that it's really going to be at. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, knowing how to buffer a road. Yeah, that's great. People are doing that 30 years ago. It's like, it's not, you know, and, and even like learn, it's like, oh, I should learn Python. Everyone knows Python. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, so the things like that, it's not really learning a language or learning a particular software. It's learning how to sort of put these component parts together. You, you, you're almost kind of learning how to be a really good project manager in that way. So it's like, here, I can take this piece over here, this piece over here. I used to tell my students, it's like, you know, they're, you know, there's a difference between an ordinary Joe that you pull off the street and put them, put them in front of a bunch of ingredients in the kitchen because they may just look at it and just be like, I, I don't know what goes together. As opposed to a chef, you put them in front of the same group of ingredients and it's like, oh, here, I'll take some of these spices and I'll take this chicken here. And I'll take these vegetables here and you make something amazing. And it's like so knowing how to do that, how to combine those different ingredients and build something really awesome. And you can do that, you know, even if, you're, if your professors or instructors aren't showing you how to do that, you can create your own projects. God, there's a, a billion YouTube videos out there that'll show you how to do it. So it's, it's a matter of, do you have the tenacity to do it on your own? It's like, you know, one thing after graduating from, you know, school is I learned how much, how little I knew, you know, it's like, oh, they, oh I'm ready to go. It's like, you get out there and it's like, oh my God, I don't know squat it's like what the hell am i going to do now so 
learning how to sort of learning how to learn and knowing how to train yourself or, you know, putting on those building blocks are really what you're going to need. But I would say sort of building, being able to handle and wield those extremely large data sets and getting meaningful output from them, whether it's a spatial environment or combining with other environments, you know, with spatial, that that's going to be, uh, that's going to be where the future's at or where it is right, where it is right now, you know. That's where I was going with it too. So yeah, definitely. We're getting more and more data coming in through sensors. So we've got uh, temperature sensors, we've got cameras, we've got, and we're pulling API data, using API to pull that information. And, and it's lots and lots of records that we're dealing with. And it's up to GIS people to help give it some meaning with place and how does that relate to other things? So yeah. I mean, for 30 years, we've been pulling together data and using different techniques, but the big data in AI is, is definitely where things are going, and, and certainly automation. Um, yeah, 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 I agree with, yeah, with this. Yeah, I think uh, maybe it should be open to all the new things like machine learning and deep learning because everyone is discussing this these things I mean, in industry. Yeah, and uh, in the meantime, because we also have, we really get a lot of data to process. I think be, study something like AWS cloud computing or Google cloud, this kind of things can be important. Yeah, because sometimes you cannot process the data locally, you need to use the cloud resources to, to process all this data. So this can be something very important. Yeah, I think for the future and for now, yeah. Yeah, even in the federal agencies that are sometimes way behind the times on things, machine learning, we just had uh, Noah's got a machine learning pilot program. One of the uh, products or uh, projects for that was an NGS pro product uh, looking at gravity information, gravity and geophysics data, because what people want is higher and higher resolution. But when we get that higher resolution, it becomes really difficult to analyze that manually. And that was uh, also one of the target applications right there, machine learning. One, one thing I do want to mention, and I've, I've experienced this before where I'm dealing with database administrators that don't understand spatial. And it's, it's, it's key to have, to keep that in mind with the geospatial industry. We, get, we kind of take it for granted, but they're looking at things in a tabular world and they don't, they don't think about geographic relationship to things. Whereas that's, that's the universal key to pull everything together. It would never, never dawn on them that, that database could, could be a, Arrange that way, so uh, you know, don't don't sell yourself short on systems thinking and geospatial thinking. Data management definitely. If you can take data management classes, and which which is sometimes different than data processing. Data processing is data processing is the data is all ready with a bow on top and it's perfect condition and it's like okay, you're run with it, you know. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure a colleague at Amazon can attest to it. It's like, you're going to have garbage pile data. And it's like, okay, now I got to rip it apart, put it back together. What's clean, what's dirty, what works, what doesn't. You need to know how to sift through that and organize and sort of, you know, deal with different scales of measurement. It's like, how do I approach this? And so that's, that's something that, you know, will, will often happen in a data science realm. And it's like, sometimes those skills are taught, sometimes they're not, you know, it really isn't. It's like, if you're given perfect data and it's like, well, I can create a perfect model with perfect data. Yeah, of course, anyone can. It's like, but if you're given imperfect data, can you create a perfect model with imperfect data? That's, that's, that's really the key. It's like, if you can, if you can do that, then you're golden. Yeah, just to roll in what Tom said about getting that, that garbage data and trying to sift through it. Noah, we've done a lot of crowdsourcing of data, a lot of it being geospatial data, you know, where there's some geospatial component that, you know, makes it all work or ties everything together. And so that's when you're crowdsourcing data, it's really important to have some way to get rid of the garbage and, and sift through it, you know, find what's valuable. Don't, don't discount cartography as well. Cartography is a dying skill that many, many people don't really concentrate on because they're all like about the data and like, oh, give me the numbers. I want the data. It's like, that's great. However, but 
think of think of your entire ac academic lives were taught how to communicate either either in a written form or a quantitative form. You know, it, making a map that can communicate in an aesthetic form is is, is a rare skill, and if you can do it properly you can blow people away because when you're looking at statistics, it's like, okay, well here, I got to read these numbers and sort of interpret them and things like that. A map that you hang on the wall or that you put on a PowerPoint presentation, okay. Or that you hand someone in a report, it has to communicate all that information in like under two seconds. It's like, boom, you got like that, that's it. And so knowing how to do that and do it effectively, it, it takes practice. It's not easy. It takes practice. It's like, and some people may make a map and be like, oh, this is my best map. And I may look at it and be like, this map stinks. Do it again. And just like, what do you mean? It's like, what was wrong? It's like, this was wrong. This is wrong. This is wrong. Because it does take, you know, honing your communication skills with the map. Um, that does take a lot of time and practice. And so, like I said, you know, I'll make a map and someone else will look at it and be like, this is amazing. But then there's other people who, you know, who taught me to make maps and it's like, they'll make a map and just like, I'm like, this is tremendous. It's like, I could have never done this. So it's, it, you know, it, but it is an acquired skill. It's like, that does take time and effort. The more maps you make, the better you'll get at it. And like, look at other maps. That's really how I learned. It's like, look at other maps. It's like, what made that map speak to me? What made that map such a good communicator? And then borrow from it, plagiarize it. It's like, well, here, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it in this map. It's like, but you know, with different data, it's like, but if you can do that, you know, you can, uh, you can definitely win over a room extremely quickly, extremely quickly. Great. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, this has been really, really helpful. I'm excited to have this recording up for folks. And um, thanks for taking time at the end of your Friday afternoon. I appreciate <laughs> you being willing to, to come and hang out and, and tell us um, about your your thoughts here. So I think without further ado, we're going to go ahead and uh, end, end the session.